guys, welcome to the Vertical Life Church online experience. I'm Kelly and I'm so excited to welcome you to our global community. We want to awaken and empower you in your walk with Jesus. And so we're going to bring you some powerful worship and an awesome message. Check it out. All right, I'm going to start off with a quote from Wayne Muller. Um, He makes this statement. He says, a successful life has become a violent enterprise. We make war on our bodies, pushing them beyond their limits, war on our culture or our children because we cannot find enough time to be with them when they are hurt and afraid and need our company, war on our spirit because we are too preoccupied to listen to the quiet voices that seek to nourish and refresh us, war on our communities because we are fearfully protecting what we have and do not feel safe enough to be kind and generous. Man, what a powerful statement that is. Could we bring up the house lights? I can't really see them out there. Um, I'd like to see your guys' faces a little bit better. But anyways, what we see here is the result of being slaves of this, what I would call maybe hustle culture and this unquenchable desire for more. You know, we want to, we feel the need to keep up with the Joneses, to buy bigger, buy better, buy uh, nicer things. And what it does, it's just creating an exhausted group of people. People are exhausted. Internally, they're exhausted. Whether they admit it or not, a lot of people, they're carrying this wariness deep down in their soul. And if anything, also with families, families are being stretched so thin. In fact, I was uh, doing a little bit of research in in regards to families eating together. No longer are families eating together. You know, 84% want to, only about 50% actually do. And if they do, it's only about three times per week. And I think my opinion is what's happening is we've partnered ourselves with with the culture that's just driving us to attain more. And we're overlooking the true things of value that that's around us in our lives. Speaking of eating together, the National Center of Addiction and Substance Abuse at Columbia University, they did research on the benefits of when you sit down with your family and eat together. The first thing is this, you know, you're less likely to be overweight you're more likely to eat healthy food, you perform better academically, you're less likely to engage in risky behaviors, which would be drugs and alcohol and sexual activity, and, you have a, and you also you end up having better relationships with your parents. That's the result of you and I actually valuing family time and spending time and sitting down as a family and eating dinner together. But instead of pursuing that, and if we do sit down, it usually looks something like this. There's this diagram or this picture I want to put behind me here. It's, I mean, look at, this is usually what the family table anymore can tend to look right, like, correct? I mean, just everyone busy, everyone consumed. Why? Because we're being driven by this need to attain. We're being driven by this need to get something bigger and nicer, and it's leaving us all exhausted. Hey, can we please turn these lights up outside here? You guys, is it dark out there or is it me? All right, it's dark. Can we turn them up a little bit? So the thing is this. What, what, what if being busy and always in a hurry is part of actually the devil's strategy to derail us and to distract us? You know, it's, you know, it talks about in Scripture in Ephesians 6 where it says that we, there's, there's schemes, that the devil has schemes against you and I. And what if one of those schemes is to keep us distracted by keeping us busy, by keeping us hustling? And I always like this. I mean, I, there's a statement I say, I'm not, a, I'm not concerned about the enemy or the devil that I see. I'm concerned about the one I don't see. And the reality is, I think in all of our lives, the devil can be sneaky, going un, unnoticed because what he's doing is just keeping us busy, keeping us in a state of hurry, keeping us in a state of exhaustion, and we're not really know, we don't really know his impact in our life. Like it says, the devil is a thief. The thief's whole goal, in case you didn't know this, is not to be what? Caught, right? You're not a very good thief if you get caught. 
You're not a very good thief. You know, I, I, I read about these uh, situations where, you know, a bank robber goes and robs a bank and then he comes back because he forgets something like a post-it note and he gets caught. Like, not a very smart thief. The whole goal of being a thief is not, being get, is not getting caught. And I think it's what's happening in our lives is that we don't understand or realize how much the state of exhaustion and weariness is having an impact on our souls. You know, the Babylonian c- culture during their times, when they would conquer or de- defeat someone, they wouldn't just defeat them in a military sense. What they would also try to do is colonize them by changing their culture, by changing their value system. So not only would they beat them by, in a military ways, but they would try to change who they were by re-identifying what they should value. And I can't help but wonder if we, as a Western culture, are being colonized right now by teaching us to value things that are not truly valuable, by valuing things like nicer, bigger homes at the expense of our time with our family, uh, valuing uh, uh, just running and hustling at the expense of building and cultivating relationships. So I would argue in some ways that we could be colonized or being colonized right now in the Western culture. And I would say that some of the turmoil, if we were honest, that we feel in our lives is a result of not pushing back or rebelling against culture's narrative to live in a state of hurry and always hustling, but instead what we do is embrace it. So we're not like rebelling against it. What we do is we get caught up in it and we just embrace it and we allow it to become a functional way of our own lives in the way that we live. And what we need to do is we need to push against that and stop being such a hurry all, all the time. Stop allowing us, ourselves to be in a state of exhaustion. You know, for some, I would say this, it's by choice. Like you're escaping situations. You have so much pain in your soul that you're ignoring it and you keep yourself busy so you don't have to face the reality of the depravity or or the voidness in your own soul. And for others, I think it's just a, a learned behavior from culture. We, we, uh, we have to be successful, right? So what we do is we, we choose to go after these things and we run after these things. And as I mentioned before, I, I believe that when we live in this constant state of hurry for our souls, um, we never find rest. We nev- we're never called to live in a state of unrest. In fact, I would argue that this leads to all kinds of issues in our social lives in our personal lives, in our spiritual lives. It's like we're exhausted. We kind of know it, but we won't admit it and we won't do anything about it because we have to keep up with what's going on around us. And if some of you were honest with yourself, you're probably one mishap, one spilt milk, one dropped egg in the kitchen, one spilt cup of coffee, one annoying email, one dirty dish in the wrong place, one driver cutting you off away from a breakdown. And the thing is, you can feel it building inside of you. You know, it's like if one more thing goes wrong, I don't know if I can hold myself together. And it's, the reality is, is that we're exhausted internally. And it's a, a thing that the Western culture, in my opinion, has gladly embraced. Even, you know, there's a hashtag hustle. Have you ever heard of that, that phrase? It's like something that we glorify, running ourselves to, to on empty. And so the reality is, is that we got to get to a place that we have true margin in our life. And I, there's this uh, list of symptoms of a hurried soul. I got this from Jean-Marc Cohen. Homer, but maybe this is something that you've been feeling and experiencing in yourself, and you can identify maybe with one of these in your own life, which would be a symptom that maybe you're more, you're more exhausted than you realize. The first one's irrit- irritability. It says it, this is basically where you're frustrated and you're annoyed way too easy, and just look at those around you how you treat them. Another one is hypersensitivity. Just, this is where minor comments hurt your feelings or it throws you into a funk and minor things become major things. Maybe it's restlessness. You just cannot rest. You, you always are multitasking all the time. Maybe it's workaholism, workaholism, which you can't stop. It's a drug of choice, it's accomplishments and doing more. And at the end of the day, your loved ones get your scraps. 
That happens to a lot of people. Like you give your best to your workplace and to everyone else, but while your loved ones and those closest to you just gets the leftovers. Emotional numbness, where you have no capacity to feel for yourself or for others, no empathy, out of order priorities. This is where you're disconnected from identity and calling, always getting sucked into the tyranny of the urgent and what's not important. You are reactive and not proactive. You're busier than ever, but have no time for what truly actually matters. Lack of care for your own body. No time for the basics like sleep and health, home-cooked food. You're gaining weight. You cannot sleep. You live off of caffeine, alcohol, sugar, or processed foods. Escapist behaviors, overeating, Netflix binges, pornography, iPhone games. You know, in fact, on the iPhone games, I know there's this one game that if I download it, it's always a sign. I delete it from my phone all the time. But if I down, download it, it's a sign that something's going on, that I'm, I'm, I'm exhausted somewhere, you know. And so then I delete it. It's like, it's, like a, it's like a warning sign for me, you know. And then, you know, man, you stay in the bathroom a little bit too long playing your game or watching news or whatever. And if you're not careful, you're going to end up with hemorrhoids. And so you cannot use these, you can't use these things, though, to escape from reality. It's, and it's the the truth is, is that it's not that all of these things are bad. They're just a bad medication for a sick soul, okay? And so another symptom is a slippage from spiritual disciplines. Like you have time for everything else, but, time, but no time for the Lord. No time to spend in prayer and reading scripture and attending church and building your spiritual community around you. Another symptom is isolation. You're disconnected from God and from others. You're never present, you actually, in fact, if you're honest, you create barriers to avoid relationships. You know, you're one of those individuals when you're around people in a room, you, have, you're, you're, you don't want really anyone to talk to you. You feel out of place, so you hide behind your phone and you just scroll and you look. You pretend that you're reading and you're busy. In reality, you're just so afraid to connect with someone else. You're using your phone as, as, some, as a, a wall to kind of hide behind. Put your phone down and build relationships. Do not escape. Don't seek isolate, isolation. Now, the reality of all these things is that they're actually heart issues. And what we want to do a lot of times is that we want to blame everything on external factors in our life and not be honest with ourselves that we can have a heart issue. You know, I love what John Ortberg says. He says, hurry is not just a disordered schedule. Hurry is a disordered uh, heart. What a powerful statement. Even in Proverbs 4.23, it says, Keep your heart with all vigilance, for from it flow the springs of life. And so a lot of things that we're facing and we're dealing with, there's a temptation to say, hey, I want to blame it on this, or I want to blame it on that. In reality, we need to examine and look at and audit our own hearts and what our own hearts are valuing. A lot of times it's a value system. What are you valuing? Like just stop and like, hey, what I'm spending my time on, is it truly worth it? Am I actually giving my affection, my time to things that truly matter? You know, uh, Father Ronald Rawheiser, he makes a statement. We, for every kind of reason, good and bad, are distracting ourselves into spiritual oblivion. It is not that we have anything against God, depth, and spirit. We would like these. It is just that we are habitually too preoccupied to have any of these show up on our radar screens. We are more busy than bad, more distracted than non-spiritual, and more interested in the movie theater, the sports stadium, and the shopping mall, and the fantasy life that they produce in us that we, than we are in church. Pathological busyness, distraction, and restlessness are major blocks today within our spiritual lives. And so what we're doing is we're giving our affection, our attention to these things, and we're finding out it's leaving us empty. It's leaving us void, wanting and desiring that more. There has to be something else. In fact, Warren Buffett, I'm going to quote him. This is, I think this is great. He says, the most dangerous distractions are the ones you love, but that don't love you back. And that's what we do. We give ourselves to these things. And what we find out is, hey, we're getting nothing, we're truly getting nothing back. So the question that we have to ask ourselves is how, so how do we truly find rest? Like how do we find rest for our own souls? 
I mean, what do you do? When you find yourself in a place of exhaustion and being tired, what is it? Is it a day off on Saturday where you just lay around and watch college football? Or maybe it's a day on Sunday where you lay around and, and maybe, maybe you barbecue and you watch some football and then you live for that moment every week. But if you're honest with yourself, is it really, do you, are you really finding rest? Like, so how do we find rest? Is it going out on the golf course? Ladies, is it shopping? Is it, is it working on your house? I'm not sure what your answer to that is, but I think that we have to first answer to truly find, find rest. We have to answer or give a response to what I believe is one of the greatest invitations that we have been given in all history. And it's from Jesus. And so we're going to look here at Matthew 11, 28 through 30. Listen, he says, call to me all who labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you what? Rest. So he's telling us right here how you and I can truly find rest, which is what we all want to some degree. We want to find rest. And instead of throwing ourselves at all these different things, Jesus is telling us how we can actually truly find rest. There's three things that first stick out to me here. One of them is the offer, the reality that rest is available. So no matter where you find yourself at today, I'm going to tell you, you might push back and say, well, my, Jeremy, my situation is completely different. No, Jesus is saying that rest is available to all, every one of us. So first you got to realize there's an offer. The second thing I notice here is the command. It's subtle, but he says, come away. In order to come away, that means you're leaving something. And often we don't want to leave the things that we have given our attention to, even though it's robbing us of rest. We, we have a hard time walking away from those things. But what Jesus is saying here is he's saying, hey, let go of those things. Come away and follow after me. Come, come to me. The third thing is what I mentioned earlier. This is available to everyone. And the, and the, the reality is that sometimes you don't even know that you're exhausted. Like it takes your family around you, those who know you well enough and to look at you and say, hey, something's going on. Are you okay? And your first response is like, I'm fine. But every around, everyone around you is like, hey, something's off. Have you ever been in that situation? Or maybe you know someone. They're denying it. Like, I'm okay. Leave me alone. And you're like, you're not okay. Something's wrong. I know you. I've, been, I, I've known you for a long time. Something's off. I think you're more tired and weary than you, than you realize. I love what Rebecca Lyons says. She says, staring into a mirror might show us what we look like in the moment, but it cannot show us who we are or where we're going. I think, that's, I think what's kind of scary is sometimes we don't even know the, the path that we're on that we're actually on a path of exhaustion and everyone around us once again can see it, but we're ignoring that reality because we look at ourselves in the mirror right now, I'm okay, not realizing that the path that we're on is, is a path of our own demise. Thomas Merton, this Catholic monk, he makes a statement, we cannot find him unless we know we need him. We forget this need when we take a self-sufficient pleasure in our own good works. The poor and helpless are the first to find him who came to seek and to save that which was lost. And so the reality, that's such good news. We need to admit, hey, I can't do this on my own. I can't do this in my own strength. I am internally exhausted. I can't put on the face anymore. I can't pretend anymore. When I'm by myself at night, maybe you cry yourself to sleep. Maybe when you're driving to work, you feel the pressure of trying to keep up with the slave driving culture that we're in. And, and, you, and you're like, hey, I can't do this. And Jesus is saying, that's the point. You need to admit that I'm exhausted exhausted. I am the one that can truly give you rest. And notice what he says here. This is how you take my yoke and you upon you and learn from me for I'm gentle and lowly in heart. Listen, I believe that we're deceived when we think that rest is void of any work or activity. That is not what Jesus is saying. There's nowhere in Scripture where Jesus is telling us here, hey, stop. Stop doing everything. And that's what we do a lot of times. We think that we're exhausted. And so usually the first thing that goes is our commitment to God. 
the first thing that goes, hey, I'm in the busy season. I'm busy, like, just chasing everything in this world and society. I got to get, get that big, nice house and that new car and all these things. I'm too busy for the kingdom of God. That's what happens. We put him on the back burner, and we're wondering why we do not find rest. It's what we've yoked ourselves to is the reason that we're not find, finding rest. And that's the key right here. It's not what you're doing. It's who you are doing it with. He didn't address their activity, but who they were in relationship with. He addressed their yoke. It's what we partner ourselves to. A yoke is where there's, it's two being bound together to move as one unit. And so my question for you is, what are you yoked to? Some of you, you've tied your life up with the wrong things, with the pace of culture, maybe even things like internal wounds or relationships you no longer need to run with, maybe society and culture or other people's burdens or the American dream. You've yoked yourself to that and you find yourself restless and tired. And Jesus is telling you here, hey, drop that, take up my yoke and learn from me. And that learn from me is a knowledge that's gained by experience with the teacher. It's not something you just sit and read about. It's spending time with him. It's caught, not just taught. And so he's telling us here to learn from him. It's still a yoke, but this yoke is not a burden of religion or of tasks, but the invitation to a relationship in which you are yoked with Jesus, learning from him and being changed by him. And for some of you, that terrifies you because you have been like watching Jesus from a distance. The thing that scares you the most is actually being in relationship with him because you feel like there's areas in your life that need to change. And when he comes into our life, I'm telling you, he does change things, but it's always for our good. Amen. It's always for our good. Another way that you can read this passage here, Michael Green says this. He says, take my yoke. You'll be working, walking, moving forward, carrying what I tell you to carry, even your own cross. Life might be uncomfortable, hard, and trying, but irony of ironies, walk my way and you will find rest. The refreshment that comes with forgiveness, the renewal that comes with purposeful living, and the rest that comes from working for me. And so finding rest, Jesus is telling us here, is not about avoiding work. It's not about stopping everything. It's about answering the question, what have I yoked myself to? What is driving me? What have I partnered with in making a decision? Hey, I need to change what I've allowed to be the driving factor within my life. He continues there and he says, and you will find rest for your souls. This is not a maybe. This is a guarantee. I'm telling you how you can find rest with the words of Jesus here. He's telling you and I, this is how you find rest. You can continue doing what you're doing now by just avoiding the reality of, of society and culture and what's going around you by just keeping yourself busy. Or you can try to find rest by, on Saturdays by watching your college football. But what you'll find out is in the end, you still feel empty. And he's telling us here, this is how you find rest. For my yoke is easy and my burden is light. So from this passage, passage what I see is that rest is found when we walk with God. So I would say this, that rest is evidence that I'm walking with God. If you don't have rest, I bet your pace is not in aligned with him. I bet if you don't have rest, you're either walking in front of him or behind him. You're not walking with him. If you don't have rest, I guarantee it's an issue of what you've yoked yourself to, the cares, the worries, the desires of life, hustling, it's not being yoked with him. We need to be yoked with him. Rest is evidenced. I am walking with God. So what does this look like? What does it look like to embrace this yoke? I'm going to give you three, three areas that we can focus on. The first one is this, is embrace 
his leadership. You know, looking at the life of Jesus, what we can see is that even though Jesus was God, he still submitted his life to his father. He lived a life of submission. John 6, 38 says, For I have come down from heaven, not to do my own will, but the will of him who sent me. John 4, 34 says, Jesus said to them, My food is to do the will of him who sent me and to accomplish his work. And so we see that Jesus lived a submitted life. And so the question I have for you when it comes to Jesus, have you truly, have I truly submitted my life to him? Or is it just a game? Like I think in reality, like we just pretend that we submitted our life to him. But in reality, we're still in control. We want to be in control. We give Jesus certain parts of our heart, but we don't hand them the master key to our lives. We resist his leadership. I, I believe that we constantly and consistently resist his leadership in our lives. And you cannot be in relationship with Jesus and not change. You will either reject him or accept him. And so the reality is, is that have you truly submitted your life to him? Is he the one leading your life? You know, it says here in Jeremiah 6.16, I think, this, this passage is real to us today. In, this, in a sense, it says, the Lord says, stand by the roads and look and ask for the ancient paths where the good way is and what? Walk in it and find rest for your souls. But they said, we will not walk in it. So let's just not overcomplicate this. I think a lot of times we're just rebelling against God in our life. We are refusing his leadership in our life and we're wondering why we don't find rest because we're living in a state of disobedience. We're not embracing his leadership. We're not embracing his yoke in our our lives. Professor Stephen Prothero makes this statement. He says, in the United States, Jesus is widely hailed as the king of kings, but it is a strange sort of sovereign who is so slavishly responsive to his subject. The American Jesus is more of a pawn than a king, push around in a complex game of cultural chess, sacrifice here for this cause and there for another. I know that's referring to a like kind of a macro level of how whether it's a political party or different movements will try to attach the name Jesus to it and use him as a pawn for their own agenda. But I don't think we're that different either. I think Jesus often is more of a pawn in our lives to get what we want than he is a king in our lives. Hey, Jesus, come and follow me and bless what I do. Not really, hey, following him. We want him just to follow us and just bless us and whatever we just decide to do. And then we judge him based on whether we feel blessed or not in life. We have to submit our lives to him. So two questions that I think we could ask ourselves of whether or not we're embracing his leadership is this. One, what are you doing that you aren't supposed to be doing? Because we overcomplicate things. Yeah, it's very good. You're right. (laughs) We just overcomplicate things. What we want is a message that's so broad we don't have to apply it to our life. So then we can create our own commentary of what we should do with it. No, I'm going to ask you point blank questions. I'm failing you as a leader and we're failing you as a church if we're not teaching you to look more like Jesus. So what are you doing that you aren't supposed to be doing? What are you not doing that you're supposed to be doing? Simple questions to identify whether or not you're, you are truly embracing his leadership in your life. The second, second thing is this, is embrace his friendship. You know, Faith for Exiles, it's this It's this book, and in it, they did this research on, they were trying to ask the question of what keeps the youth, what keeps young adults in the church and to continue as Christians? Like, we know all these reasons for why they leave, but what are the reasons for those 
to stay? Like, why did they stay? And one of the main things was that they found that each individual had a personal relationship with Jesus. They weren't just learning about Jesus from a distance. They actually had a personal daily encounter or relationship with Jesus on a regular basis. It wasn't something they were just learning about from a pastor or a youth pastor, but they themselves were pursuing him and seeking him. And so I think it's the same thing for us. We got to realize that Jesus wants to walk with us and he's inviting you and I into relationship. And so we need to have our own daily relationship with him, spending time with him. But the way we do Western church anymore, it's almost like we create these systems and these programs that in some way I think resist the reality of you needing to be in relationship with Jesus because we're just going to feed you everything you need and then you don't have to have your own relationship with Jesus. In fact, that's one of the things that says in this book, Faith for Exiles, it says, having been exposed to Christianity, people form patterns and habits that resist deeper faith. These faith antibodies are part of the natural human bent away from God but also are exasperated by Christian structures that enable superficial skin deep spirituality. It's a powerful thing. Saying that the Christian church is basically the, a lot of times the reason we're not in relationship with God because we create a surface level thing. And I'll be honest, the one reason a lot of times that people do not like Vertical Life Church is because we're pushing you to be in relationship with Jesus in your own life asking you pointed questions and it gets uncomfortable. It truly gets uncomfortable. But the reality is, is like, guys, we're here as a, as a body that we're supposed to help you and myself to mature and look like Jesus. Amen. Not just talk about him. Like even in worship, we're not just here singing a set list and seeing what happens. Just like, okay, we're, we're done through our set list. No, we're worshiping the King of Kings. And so we went, hey, can we get through this set? I, I got things to do. There's a football game coming on, you know. The Buffalo Bills are playing today. Whatever's happening. We need to get through this. Not realizing that we're coming into the presence of a king. We pretend we're a king. We act more like cats than we do dogs. I know it's a weird analogy, but a cat, you know, it's all about them. Is it not? A cat is like, ah, looks at you and walks away. One day lets you pet it, next day it scratches you and bites you and where's the dog no matter what? It's your best friend, right? When we walk in a room, we act like God owes us something. No, we need to embrace him, the offer, the relationship, the friendship with him. If you don't know where to start, like I'll give you a very practical, easy way to start. Get in this for yourself. Open it up. And just say, Holy Spirit, please teach me. And read just a section and then ask yourself this question. How can I respond in obedience to that text? Not just knowledge. How can I respond with obedience to that? And then watch things begin to change in your life. I guarantee it. In fact, look at this research. They did a study on 40,000 people from the ages of zero to 80 of people, what they experienced when they spent time in the, world, in the Word. If they spent one time per week, which is usually maybe church service, it had pretty much no effect. If they spent two times, pretty much the same thing. If they spent three times, based on their research, they saw a little bit like a little blip of its impact in their life. But if they spent four times a week in the Word of God, notice what, it, there's a dramatic change and impact in your life. I'm going to have them put the, the stats behind me. One, feeling lonely dropped by 30%. Anger dropped by 32%. Bitterness in relationships dropped 40%. Alcoholism dropped 50%. Feeling spiritually stagnant dropped by 60%. Pornography dropped by 61%. Sharing your faith jumped 200%. And discipling others jumped 230%. Why? Because spending time in this word and asking, Holy Spirit, please open my eyes to this and help me to obey it. Help me to submit my life to this. Help me to embrace your friendship. Amen. The final thing is this, is embrace purpose. You know, there's a reason. There's always a reason for a yoke. 
and it's to serve a greater purpose. And sometimes the reason we don't have rest, we, we can't find re rest, is because we're living outside of purpose or without purpose. We're aimless. And we're so busy that we do not take the time to make the needed changes. Now, even Socrates himself says the unexamined life is not worth living. Who are you becoming? What is the purpose to your life? Do you have any purpose in your life? If not, begin to ask, Holy Spirit, show me what you have called me to do. And whatever field you're in, that doesn't mean you leave your, the, the marketplace and you throw yourself in the mission field. For some of you, that may be the answer. But it could be like, hey, you called me into this place in the marketplace. What does it look like for me to partner with the Holy Spirit and do this with excellence? But we have to live with a sense of purpose and direction. If not, we will feel like an aimless and exhausted group of people. Let's stand. Father, I just thank you that we, we as a vertical life body, God, I just want to be a people who embrace your leadership in our life, embrace your friendship and embrace your purpose of what you're wanting to do. Maybe we've been running a rat race and just doing what we want and chasing the American dream, really giving no thought to the person that we're becoming. The Holy Spirit, that you begin to highlight what you're calling us into. Give us clarity, give us vision, give us direction. Give us the grace to run hard after you, God to embrace your leadership, to embrace what you're calling us to. And as a result of, a, of that, let us truly find true rest, true rest that we'll put down the yoke of this world and we would embrace your yoke, that we would run with you, that we would partner with you. In Jesus' name we pray. And we all say, amen. Thank you so much for joining us today. We hope that today's service was an encouragement and a blessing to you, and we would love for you to share it with your friends and family. If you have any prayer requests, testimonies, or anything you'd like to share, send us an email at hello at verticallife.church or reach out to us on any of our social media platforms. We hope you guys have an awesome week. See you next time.